How wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss a somewhat bizarre discovery coming from a relatively distant cluster that represents a fascinating new astronomical discovery highlighting how little we know about massive stars and how many of them still contain so many secrets. And specifically we're going to discuss the star you see behind me, currently referred to as DFK52. A somewhat bizarre red supergiant, located in a very massive stellar cluster known as Stevenson 2, that though at first appeared quite ordinary, turned out to be really strange and seems to contain some kind of an extraordinary mechanism, creating really baffling surroundings around it. And so let's discuss this discovery in more detail, talk about what we know and what we don't know, and of course why this is important. But first a super quick primer on the super giant stars and what we generally know about them. Now these are truly colossal stars, among the largest in the universe by volume, though usually not the most massive and not the most luminous. Scientifically we refer to them as Yerkes class 1 supergiants with a spectral type of K and M, which basically means that they kind of resemble orange and red stars in terms of color and have surface temperature below 4100 Kelvin which is actually colder than the sun. And most of these red supergiants represent a relatively brief but very dramatic phase in evolution of massive stars, specifically those with initial masses of 8 to 40 solar masses. And once these stars exhaust their hydrogen, they generally expand and cool significantly, transforming into these very luminous giants. And by the way, Betelgeuse is the most famous of them all. You can actually learn about the recent incredible discovery from Betelgeuse, in one of the recent videos in the description. But for these stars, this phase is critical because the mass loss they experience during this time profoundly influences their evolution and, crucially, changes the characteristics of the type 2p supernova they eventually go through. And for most of these stars, the mass loss can vary quite dramatically. Some of them are pretty slow or experience more traditional mass loss, usually losing one solar mass per million years. So once again, for example, Betelgeuse, while others are normally more luminous and can create some really extreme emissions. One good example here is the famous V.Y. Canis Majoris. These stars usually show much higher asymmetric outflows and generally have rates at least 100 times higher per year. So essentially here they lose one solar mass every 10,000 years. And these extreme stars are known for having observable nebula in their surroundings. This is of course one from the Canis Majoris. And most of these stars also exhibit some type of visual variability. Many of them basically blink and change in brightness. But, well, let's talk about this new discovery from this new star, or I guess technically a star we've known about before, but that has never been studied in detail, because we seem to have something super extreme. Although first, so where exactly is this? Now this is in the Milky Way galaxy, inside the cluster known as Stevenson 2. This is a massive open cluster, it contains at least 26 red supergiants and is about 5.8 kiloparsecs away from the sun, or about 18,000 light years. And quite a lot of previous studies have actually seen the star before, but generally characterized DFK52 as rather ordinary. It was basically not on anyone's radar until now, with the observations of its carbon monoxide absorption band suggesting that it's a typical M0 type supergiant, or in other words, a red supergiant not so different from Betelgeuse. Obviously though, it was quite bright, at approximately 20,000 solar luminosities. But for red supergiants, that's also considered to be kind of dim. Although here there was at least one hint that something was bizarre. Here what's known as the J-band flux was suspiciously low. Or basically something was extinguishing the star and making it dimmer than it should be. With the first assumption being some kind of a circumstellar dust. But these initial observations did not prepare astronomers for what ALMA would reveal. And so here the observations by the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array or ALMA uncovered a circumstellar environment of unprecedented scale and unprecedented complexity as well. Or basically here we had a bubble of gas that wasn't just slightly larger, it was absolutely enormous, stretching up to about 50,000 astronomical units in radius, which is half as large as the entire solar system in size. And what makes this puzzling is that DFK52 is actually relatively normal otherwise. And so whatever is happening here and whatever mechanism is at work, it seems to be somewhat mysterious and, of course, somewhat unique. 
And so here by observing the star at 1.3 millimeters in wavelengths, with a focus on circumstellar emissions and observations of different bands of carbon monoxide and silicon oxides, scientists were able to uncover a lot more detail. But the challenge here was of course dealing with huge contamination from all of this interstellar medium. And so careful data processing was important, representing the most challenging part. And it's of course all of this interstellar medium, or basically all of this dust, that was essentially hiding this mysterious star. But following a thorough analysis, scientists behind the study in a description were finally able to reveal the overall dynamics around the star. For example, here by tracing the dust dynamics, instead of a compact source, they observed a highly complex structure. There was an extremely low brightness extended component elongated from north to south and different types of motion and velocity surrounding the object. Now, as I mentioned before, this is at least 50,000 astronomical units in length. And in comparison to, for example, the most active star that I showed you previously, the Y Canis Majoris, that's approximately 63 times larger. And so dfk 52s dust envelope seems to be tens if not hundreds of times larger than a typical red supergiant, especially some of the most extreme examples known to us. And within this extended component, they identified the more compact, brighter clumps, in this image labeled with A, B, and C, projected at distances of 5800, 12,000, and 18,500 AU away from the central star. And surprisingly, these unusual clumps represent approximately 15% of the total brightness. But crucially, there was no central peak in the location where we expect the star to be. Now, because these observations were in microwave frequencies of 220 gigahertz, these clumps represent some kind of a major chunk of molecular matter and are obviously not shown as the brightness from the star itself. But exactly how these clumps were produced and why they were produced, that's of course the question we cannot answer. On top of this, the star's spectral energy distribution showed a clear double peak shape, which was very different from other red supergiants and was not easy to explain. Essentially here, it seems to have at least two different peaks of brightness in two different frequencies. And so the combination of these bizarre peaks and the absence of central emissions strongly suggested that dust emissions are dominated by cold, detached components with the average dust temperature of approximately 50 Kelvin. Or basically that the star was really, really bright, but just mostly in microwave frequencies and mostly as a result of huge amounts of chunky gas that was all over the place. With the total amount of dust in this region estimated to be at least 21 masses of Jupiter, and that was just dust. Here there was also obviously gas like hydrogen and helium, which represented at least 1.3 solar masses. And so in other words, this huge bubble around the star can actually easily form its own star system with several Jupiter-like planets, if it was to somehow recombine and become more compact, while also confirming a lot of highly asymmetric and bar-like structures that seem to be extending across the stellar position. And exactly why they look this way and what's happening here is once again currently unknown. But surprisingly, the carbon monoxide gas seems to be moving much faster than silicon oxide, with a velocity that's at least two and a half times higher. And here, because of such differences in velocity and because of this bizarre shape, researchers believed that there was some kind of a real dramatic emission that happened approximately 4,000 years ago. So basically, most of these shapes and most of these emissions potentially happened as a dramatic mass loss, maybe somewhat similar to what happened to Betelgeuse in 2019, but involving huge amounts of mass. And so exactly what caused this emission and what happened 4,000 years ago is also unknown. But this enormous complex and this highly symmetric circumstellar environment can only be explained if thousands of years ago there was a dramatic, fast mass loss followed by a return to much slower, more symmetric and more typical mass loss rate that's happening today. So essentially this was just some kind of a freak event that suddenly expanded the star causing it to lose so much mass. But I guess the main question here is, okay, so why is this important? Well, this puzzling object is just really bizarre compared to all of the other supergiants. The star itself is relatively dim and is not particularly exciting, but what's happening around it suggests emissions that are at least four times more powerful than some of the most extreme stars we've seen before. And this means that whatever is happening around this star seems to be entirely unique and something we've never seen before, possibly involving some kind of a really freak event. Or maybe this is just a general mechanism that the star uses, suggesting that this is a true unique object amongst other red supergiants. But what exactly could have happened 4,000 years ago and what's causing the star to lose so much mass? Well, we do have certain propositions. First one is some kind of a short-lived super wind period. 
This is based on the observations of carbon monoxide and would basically involve the star suddenly becoming very, very active and producing a lot of wind, forming very dense pre-supernova environments, which actually have been observed in a lot of type 2 supernova. But normally these super winds are followed by the supernova itself, yet here the star did not explode, which is a somewhat curious discovery. In previous type 2 supernova events, following these very powerful emissions, stars always exploded into this very dense material, usually within just a few hundred years. But here, after 4000 years, still nothing. Second explanation maybe involves some kind of an energetic companion, implying that this is a binary or even a multiple star system. And that's of course one of the explanations for Betelgeuse that we recently discussed. And so, for example, some kind of a stellar merger or an extremely close approach could have produced very complex non-spherical outflows, including bipolar and multipolar structures that's previously been seen before. And specifically if this is some kind of a common envelope situation, where a companion star plunges into the envelope and suddenly initiates a huge mass loss event that lasts for a few hundred years. And normally these events can actually produce expanding equatorial rings so much similar to the ones observed around this star. Which basically suggests that this multiple star hypothesis right now could possibly provide the best explanation. It would also explain why this star has become so dim suddenly, because that's what we expect when two stars suddenly combine. And so here at least some of the observations could be explained with a potential stellar merger 4000 years ago. And since this is a potential supernova progenitor, and since the supernova in this case could happen within the next 10,000 years, observing the FK52 and the changes inside the star could obviously teach us so much more about supernova events and how they influence the galaxy. And so in conclusion, this is just a very bizarre, very exotic and somewhat difficult to explain red supergiant, even more mysterious than Betelgeuse and even more bizarre when it comes to emissions. It also kind of challenges current models involving mass loss around massive stars, with all the shapes formed around the star and all these large complex structures just generally being very difficult to explain. With the main question of course being, so, what exactly happened 4000 years ago, and what's going to happen to the star in the near future? And that of course makes the FK52 a prime candidate for future multi-wavelength observations, which would be essential to classify this object in the process of discovering what's happening inside of it, and what's going to happen in the future. But apart from this star and apart from Betelgeuse, we actually also had a few more discoveries from other red supergiants in the last few years, and you can learn about these stars in some of the videos in the description. But on that note, once we learn something else, we'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel Patreon where you can find additional videos, videos without any ads, and can DM me directly, or by joining the channel membership that grants you early access, or maybe by buying the wonderful person t-shirt in the description below. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.